Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. Today I'd like to talk about an American artist of the 20th century. When Teresa Bernstein first exhibited in the early 1900s, she received much acclaim and great recognition. But later as the century aged, she and her works of art seemed to fade into the past. That is until she became the subject of an exhibition seminar in the art history doctoral program that distinguished Professor Gail Levin taught at the CUNY Graduate Center in the fall of 2010. Now there is a multimedia exhibition celebrating her life and work, and Professor Levin is my guest today. Thank you and welcome. Thank you, Ronnie. Pleasure to be here. It is a wonderful exhibition, and we'll talk about it later, but uh, she was was she lived to be 112? Well, less two weeks. Less two weeks, 112 years old. It is amazing. That in itself is amazing. And she even worked until yes, a couple of years. Yes, we have in the exhibition a work dated from when she was 105. <laughs> so wonderful. Um, in, you have this wonderful book that you edited uh, that has a lot of her work in it and that also has articles from members, the people who were in your seminar. Yes, it has my own uh, introductory essay and, your own and two yeah. other senior scholars and four junior scholars from that seminar. So she was a brilliant choice, wasn't she, for an exhibit uh, seminar. What does that mean, really? Uh, an exhibit, exhibition seminar? Exhibition seminar. Well, the idea was that the students would uh, conduct research and really create uh, the plan for an exhibition. Now that proved optimistic because there was no other book ever on Teresa Bernstein and so we didn't know where all the paintings were. And she was prolific, but of course I wanted to find <laughs> some of her best Lord. paintings. And we didn't even know which public collections had her work, so that was one of the things the students researched. It's so great. Did she know? I mean, you had met her by this time. Oh, yes. Um, well, she had, she knew where her works were, many of them. Perhaps she knew when she died in 2002, but <laughs> here it is, 11 oh, years oh, later. that's true. I'm sorry. I forgot that. I and <laughs> things have a, people die, people yeah. sell art, yeah, you know, and things they, have a way of moving around. She had a scrapbook that she kept so many things in. But she you, did. It was too bad she didn't list who bought what. You know, you can actually <laughs> turn the pages of that scrapbook on our website, it's, which is yeah, kind of fun. I did that. It's so great. I don't know if you noticed that she cut off the date of almost every single article. <laughs> she wanted to hide her age. It's so funny. How did you meet her? Well, um, I happened to be reading an unpublished diary in my research on Edward Hopper, on whom I've written a lot. And it was a diary of his friend and neighbor, a very obscure artist called Walter Tittle. And Tittle was writing about being at the McDowell Club on West 55th Street in Manhattan in 1918. He was writing in 1918 about in hanging a show there. And all the guys, John Sloan, the socialist, mm -hmm. Randall Davey, Edward Hopper, Tittle, and Teresa Bernstein. Mm. I thought, how interesting, a woman. Not so long after that, I noticed that Teresa Bernstein and her late husband, William Meyerwitz, were having a joint show at the New York Historical Society. This is in the early 1980s. And I said, what? She's alive? <laughs> because those boys had been dead for so long and I looked her up and called her up and went to see her. And I was just amazed by her gusto for life. She was in her 90s then. So amazing. And I was amazed by her work. Yeah. It's, it's incredible. So then you, you knew her and you were interested in her. Somehow I, th I got the idea that she thought before you wrote a book about her that you were going to write a book about her. Well, that was a <laughs> surprise for me. When I was working on the project, I learned of an oral history done by Muriel Myers in 1991 for the American Jewish Committee. It's in the Jewish division of the New York Public Library. <laughs> and in it, Teresa mentions me twice, <laughs> saying I'm putting her in a book about Edward Hopper and his friends. That's my Edward Hopper and Intimate Biography, where she has a cameo role. Uh -huh. And that was my big motivation in going to meet her, to find out about yeah. uh, Edward Hopper. Hopper and yeah. Somehow she knew. I did tell her that there should be a book on her. Uh, I believe that, but I didn't. I don't recall saying <laughs> I was going to write it. 
and you did. <laughs> she somehow knew I would because yeah. she tells Muriel Myers that I'm going to. <laughs> You're an art historian whose interest what spans 20th century art? I would say yes and Teresa Bernstein is an artist maybe the only one I know of who made and showed her work in every decade of the 20th century. It's amazing isn't it? And you're also interested in women. Very much interested in women artists yeah. and their plight, I would say. Right. And in art that relates to Judaism? Um, to Jewish culture, Jewish yes. Culture. I, I'm interested particularly, especially in the um, Jewish women artists with um, ancestry in Eastern Europe. And yeah. that, that developed um, because I got interested in how feminism might have come out of that background. Oh, well, how did it come out? Well, when you read <laughs> even literature of the Haskalah, the 19th century, the popular fiction, yeah. even if it's not pro-women, you find men complaining about their daughter's feistiness, for example, not wanting to have an arranged marriage. Interesting. So I think some of the oppressive conditions for women uh, helped to create the need for feminism, and it, I don't think it's an accident that there were so many Jewish American feminists. feminists. She must have believed in her own talent, is that right? Yes, and she was singled out. She was really headed to Bryn Mawr to become a writer, yeah. because she right. also wrote right. and, uh, articles during her lifetime, and her first book doesn't come out until she's already in her 90s, but uh, after her husband dies, she writes um, William Meyerowitz, The Artist Speaks. It's about him. She wrote 62 years of marriage. Some people have told me that she, he insisted that she promote his work over hers, not hers. Uh, but, you know, they were very happy. They yeah. had a very harmonious, so whatever she did, right. it, she, made her, it made she them happy. She managed to merge her marriage and her ambition and her, her skill. Yeah, She did. Yeah. And, and sometimes when um, she would be invited to a show and um, she didn't have a frame, and he'd spent a long time carving a new frame. He'd lend it to her. And so he was. And in one case, that museum bought the paintings and got the frame. <laughs> he didn't get it back. But she pursued. So she, I mean, er, she, they recommended that she pursue art. Yes. And um, she went to she, some art school. In high school, they yeah. saw her work. Yeah. And they said, you have to enter this competition for the Philadelphia College of Design for Women which is now Moore College of Art, mm -hmm. and her drawing she won. Did, yeah. And then they, her, everyone, the principal, the teacher, really insisted that she had to go there. She grew up in Philadelphia. Yeah. But how did she get to the point where she actually submits her work to an exhibit? Well, she was kind of a star pupil in art school. I see. And already in Philadelphia, uh, before she graduates, there are competitions or shows within Philadelphia and in the art school, and she singled out and won prizes. When I was reading the Philadelphia Inquirer yeah. back in, I think, 1909, I was amazed she was already written up winning prizes. Yeah. Was she then in a women's art group? Yes. That's uh, a fascinating part of it. And isn't there it? were women teachers as well as male teachers, and a, a woman principal of the school, the from the Sartain family, Emily and Harriet Sartain. Emily, the principal, Harriet, one of her teachers. Harriet was her art history teacher, but she was also a watercolorist. And we have Teresa's art history notebook from 1907 in the exhibition. But again, it's on the website, and you can turn the pages on the website. That's so great. But she couldn't hang in a, in a show that showed men. Well, she could, and she did. Oh, she did. Oh, well, by 1914, she right. had later. work. Yeah. At, well, that's only oh, no, that's not so much three later. years no. out of art yeah. school. Right. She's only 23 right. or 24, and yeah. she had work at the Art Institute of Chicago's annual. That's yeah. pretty good. Right. And then, but, but in 1913, she, she was in the National Academy of Design in New York in a traveling show so to great. major museums. No, she did very well very early. So was she uh, driven to do this with her exhibit, do you think? Was she driven? I guess you would have to say she it was drive. She had a pretty strong ego, right? Yes. She must have. She certainly believed in herself and right. her ability. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Definitely. And what was interesting also is the critics, and I mean, they divided it into regular art and women's art, some of them, right? Yes. That she painted like 
a woman. <laughs> or well, actually, they kept saying that she painted like a man. Oh, she painted like a man. And, and she they was were a woman. praising her for that. Right. Yes. <laughs> and when they spoke about the power in her work as being like a man, she said, well, couldn't women have power as well? After all, you know, they make babies. <laughs> it reminded me of, you know, the era when women executives to move forward had to dress like men. <laughs> so it was, it's just that same old thing that's coming and constricting it all the time. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But she, um, she pursued and she did. Yeah. But how did she, she had such a free style. I mean, she, you're, you also are, uh, the Ashcan painters are your, is a, is a special interest to you? Yeah, those are really the teachers of Edward Hopper, for example, Robert Henry, John mm -hmm. Sloan, that went out and painted, you know, street life in ordinary neighborhoods, for example. And that slice of life aspect is what made critics compare her to the Ashcan School. Actually, her work is a little more romantic than the Ashcan School. Her teach, one of her teachers was Elliot Dangerfield. It's a little bit like, um, oh, Albert Pinkham Ryder or Blake Locke, a little bit more romantic in the skies, mm. the lighting, or Rembrandt. Yeah. Are the colors, uh, uh, it, is there a, colors that are associated with that kind of painting, that school of painting? Uh, the Ashken School is sometimes considered dark. Yeah. And, uh, well, I think some of Teresa's paintings going to turn out to be lighter than we thought once oh, we get oh, the old varnish taken oh, off. Oh, that's interesting. Were they all var they're all varnished? She's pretty bright. If you look at this wonderful in the Elevated, which has been bought recently by the Fine Arts Museum, the De Young Museum in San Francisco, and is in our show here. In yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful painting. Yeah, it, it's bright. It's really bright. Because she, they she looked dark. She looked as if she was painted basically in browns and yellows and reds. She did Not sometimes, dark. and sometimes she couldn't afford the brighter colors yeah, like yeah, red. So she, she, she actually spoke about that. Yeah. And she did all kinds of work. She did these wonderful, powerful urban scenes or scenes of people, right, which were fabulous. And all the movement and the freedom and the, I just loved them. And then she also did still lifes. Yes, and she did what she called documentary yeah, stills, those, which they have were particularly sy interesting. symbolic meaning. Yeah. yeah. So how would she do that? She well, she would gather things together in her studio that were memorable. For example, I mean, when she's 82, and that's kind of a middle-aged painting for Teresa, <laughs> she does documentary still in 1972, and it has a, a dual portrait of her and her husband. It has his painting of horses. He loved to paint horses. It has a <laughs> vase with withered flowers, um, which my students and I came to believe um, represented the loss of her child. I was going to say that that's what yeah. I would imagine. And uh, of course, she had one daughter, Isadora, in 1920, when she was just 30 years old. And poor Isadora perished from pneumonia before she was four months old. Mm. Uh, and they never had any other children. They weren't able to have other children, but Teresa memorialized her in a number of paintings, one called Joy of Life, one called Loss. In Loss and Joy of Life, there are the Grim Reaper or mm. figure of death from the Talmud, however you want to interpret it. But also, there's a little angel in Loss on the vase. Mm. Did, there's, did she ever talk about not having more children? She didn't say why. She talked about the loss of Isadora in, in the book, William Meyerowitz, The Artist Speaks. Mm -hmm. And she, she was um, very nurturing of her nieces and nephews, great, uh, great nieces and nephews also. He, he did a lot of etching, didn't he? Yes. His, he was a painter also, but he was a specialist as a printmaker and etcher, and especially colored etchings. Uh, William Marwitz is well represented in the Library of Congress, for example. It's so interesting. And she started to do that, too. She learned to etch from her husband. She never did much with colored etching, um, a little bit of experimentation. But she took up monoprints, which is another kind of printmaking, which her husband didn't do. And um, <laughs> that that's a, a simpler process where you can work on a plate or a glass and uh, 
the image gets reversed when you print it. You can print it by hand or in a press. On that wonderful website, when I said that it was a multimedia project, it's this great book and um, this wonderful exhibition, which is in two places in the CUNY system, right, at Baruch and at the Graduate Center. And it's not going to be there too long. It's um, continuing now at the Graduate Center. Before it goes on a national tour, um, it's going to four more museums, mm -hmm. ending up in Boca Raton, Florida. Before that, it's going to Phillips Museum of Art at Franklin and Marshall, Endicott College in Beverly, Massachusetts, which is near Gloucester on Cape Ann, where mm -hmm. Teresa Spenner Summers, and the Woodmere Art Museum in Philadelphia. So great. But it's going to be at CUNY until when? Um, January 18th. Now, the third component of this project is, is the website and what's on there. And it, it was wonderful. What reminded me was you're talking about how she etched. She's got a whole lesson about how she etches on a video in this yes. project. And on the, in the, in the, on the online, you can see her pages from her diary and you see her artwork. And it, it's just all together such a rich a group of and so I think um, representing this rich artist she was also though she had a social conscience oh yes she was a real activist and she was a suffragist you yeah. know she is one of the few artists um, even in the benefit exhibitions for the suffrage movement in 1915 who depicted the suffrage movement suffrage meeting suffrage parade are in the book they're in the exhibition here at the graduate center yeah, and then she, I loved the picture of the milliners, the women working. Oh, isn't, I love that, Isn't too. that a wonderful picture? From 1919, and you know, that was a typical Jewish immigrant occupation. It was a kind of a home sweatshop where they would make artificial flowers and attach yeah. them to hats. Yeah. And uh, William's sister, Sophie, had that job. And all of William's sisters and her mother and his mother are posing for that painting. She, she put her family members in a lot of paintings, didn't she? She did. It was a very <laughs> inexpensive way to have models. I see. So that was, uh, she did it. They posed for her? They actually posed for her? Absolutely. Yeah. In the elevated, is that what it was called? Her, before she's married, it's her mother and father. Yeah. And after she's married, she marries a man <laughs> with a lot of sisters. <laughs> that was good for her. Yeah. But she also had, she also, when she had some money, paid for, oh, she had a famous model. A very famous model, the Baroness Elsa <laughs> Uh, von Freitag Loringhoven, who got recommended to her by Marcel Duchamp, a friend uh -huh. who knew her painting uh, from various exhibitions that he saw. He arrived from France in 1915. Uh -huh. And later, Marcel Duchamp played chess often with William, uh -huh. Teresa's husband. Right. And she was quite close to uh, Stuart Davis. Yes. Um, she liked to go and hear jazz with Stuart Davis. He was a neighbor in Gloucester and she knew him in the city also. And he appears actually in a painting which is called Chess Players. <laughs> uh, William is playing with a chess champion, but Stuart Davis is looking on and Teresa puts herself in the background. And, but, and she did these wonderful paintings of jazz people. Yes, oh, I mean, Pap Calloway, Minnie the Moocher, right. um, Lil <laughs> Hardin and Louis Armstrong. And they're so free. I mean, is there a way of categorizing her work? Well, you know, she was initially compared to the Ashkent School, mm -hmm. but then she becomes, by the late 20s, um, the second half of the 20s, much more expressionistic. And while their works are always figurative, they're never abstract, they're looser. Mm. And, that's, and that's called more expression. I think, yes. Yeah. And I think that the kind of influence of jazz, the spontaneity of jazz, mm -hmm. kind of infiltrated her art style. So interesting. They lived in a studio apartment. It well, was their studio. How it was their lost? studio. How it, big was it? <laughs> uh, it was much bigger than a than, typical New York studio, uh -huh. but it was their workplace and their home. And what William did is take raw space and add a balcony. Uh -huh. And neither one of them was very tall, so it wasn't that hard to do. <laughs> that was very cute. And then, of course, you've mentioned Gloucester. They went there every summer. Yes, she went before she met William from 1916. And that was a very lively group of artists up there. Oh, it was. Um, when she first arrived there, though, of course, she was Jewish. And there weren't a lot of really? Jewish artists on the scene. And she wasn't initially welcomed, shall we say. There was no room at the end when she arrived. But gradually, 
the highest levels of society in Gloucester came to adore Teresa, so much so that when she and her husband, uh, they had been living in uh, Ellen Day Hale and Gabrielle DeVoe Clemens' um, print studio and using the print, printer press there, but they were helped to buy their home in 1924. I think they made a $40 down payment, mm. but their friends put them right in touch with a banker. Yeah, that's and sticky. they fixed up that home and lived in it the rest of their lives. How much did the person who buy it buy it for, do you know? <laughs> I'm sure it was in the hundreds of thousands. Yeah. Yeah. Not, uh, it's a, quite an inflation. <laughs> they also wrote, um, they had a newspaper. Yes. It was a very activist, well show me. It was a oh. very activist group of, of artists. Yes, with Stuart Davis and Even Cummins, they put together for, um, in the early 20s, uh, a kind of Dada, um, meaning nonsensical newspaper, to raise money for the local uh, art association. They were very active with local artists in Gloucester. Uh, are artists today, um, do they follow a similar life? I would say, you know, I'm out on eastern Long Island mm -hmm. in the summers often, and I would say that there continues to be a local art scene as well as artists that are more famous from New York out there. And um, and there is close knit and I, I think yeah, you could they say are. so. Yeah, I'm so, I'm thinking of some I know. Yeah. And yeah. This well, you know, they knew various people like um, Teresa writes about knowing Rabbi Stephen Wise, mm. who was pretty socially active. Oh yes, very. Uh, for example, and um, and they were strong supporters of. Uh, she she writes about he decided that women deserve the vote. He yeah, told her. Is that right? Yeah, and she met um, Emmy Pankhurst when she came over, the feminist from when, England. Yeah, suffragist when she came from England, and so she um, was very contemporary. Lillian Russell, um, the actress who was advocating for suffrage, mm -hmm. and others. You write in the, in this book that they had a very hard time during the Depression, but there's no mention of uh, the WPA. Well, she didn't work on the WPA, but she did have a mural commission from the U.S. Treasury Department, which was a parallel program. Mm -hmm. Why weren't they involved with the WPA? That's think? a good question, and I don't know, although you had to be on relief, and probably oh, they, they weren't. Yeah. No, because they were getting commissions, for example, to do portraits of Supreme Court justices, particularly William, and some of the professors at Harvard, Teresa did port so they took portrait commissions. And I think Teresa would have been too proud mm. to say she was on relief to get mm. on the WPA. I wondered how she managed to get all her paintings to the different exhibits. <laughs> how she managed to get in? No, just the physical oh. transport. How does somebody like her get her, her canvases mm. to an art exhibit? <laughs> I'm not so sure I know the yeah. answer to that. Yeah. Um, uh, basically, ship, shippers, yeah. uh, commercial shippers. But if she had no money at w sometimes, or it was very little. Well, she does negotiate with museums if she's... Yeah. Um, she was a sharp negotiator, wasn't she? Oh, she was. You know, there's a famous <laughs> story that late in life she told her dealer, now the way to sell my art is let all the people come to the opening and you lock the doors and don't unlock them until they bought. <laughs> And you also say that anytime somebody goes to visit her, sometimes she'd give them a painting as a present, but often she wanted to sell it. Yes. <laughs> you know, it isn't so much that she necessarily demanded from someone more money than they could afford. She let them pay over time, or she would sell things for very little, but I think she wanted to know that you valued her work uh -huh. and you would keep it safe. Uh -huh. And how much did her paintings sell for, do you know? Well, I mean, they went for all different prices at all different times in her life. I would say she was um, perhaps undervalued at the end because her reputation, which was so high in 1929 that Edwin Alden Jewell, the critic for the New York Times, said it's Teresa Bernstein's show that's attracting all the throngs. And he mentioned also Hopper, Edward Hopper, Harmon, and one other one, I forget who. But I don't even know who Harmon was. Mm. I'm <laughs> sure I could discover if I yeah. kept digging. But why was she eclipsed? What happened that she went down? Well, of course, there's the Depression. Yeah. 
then there's the young artists that become known right. after the war, right. the abstract expressionists, and she would never she didn't become want abstract, no. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it's like fashion, people move on to right. the, the, the next, next generation. Thing. It is really tough. And, and there was ageism already. Um, by 1960, yeah. she was written about in Art News as in, when she had a show in New York, as, as the work of an older artist. She was only 70. <laughs> and little she was did they know she'd be going. under 10. <laughs> well, Gail Levin, we've come to the end of this, so I hope that people will be interested and go and see the exhibit before it ends. And is this book, uh, do you buy it? Yes, this is um, available online. It's um, published by the University of Nebraska Press. It's available at Rizzoli in New York yeah. and other bookstores, as well as the usual yeah. online vendors. And the website of your, your... Uh... Uh, the website is um, for, uh, I do want to say that Elsie Young, one of my students, um, produced and created the website with research done by all my students. Uh -huh. Well, thank you so much, Gail Levin. I look forward to the next artist you're going to tell us about. Thank you so much. Thank you. Is there any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore? Please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.